so this is our first panel of the program, and we've brought together people to talk to you what we call the marketplace of ideas, but we really want them all to talk about the whole effort of lobbying uh, and in relationship to foreign policy, in relationship to its conceiving foreign policy, developing it, imp implementing it, and most importantly, influencing it. Uh, we have people from three different sectors who are going to be talking to you. From the business world, we just heard Mr. Rothkoff's uh, talk about, uh, that was about one aspect of business, but Aaron Ennis, who is the Vice President of the U.S.-China Business Council, an organization that's very involved in China policy uh, in the corporate world, and an organization that the National Committee is sort of our sister organization. We're very pleased to have her with us. Um, we've asked Lawrence McDonald to talk about how think tanks um, influence and help shape for American foreign policy. And then John Isaacs, who worked at, I'm sorry, Lawrence was with an important think tank here called the Center for Global Development. And then Mr. Isaacs, John Isaacs, who is going to talk about how NGOs, non the nonprofit sector in this country, um, influences and help shapes foreign policy. And we've asked each of them to talk about this subject on a broader level, representing their own community, so representing NGOs, representing think tanks, representing the business world, but using, if they wish and when they want to, their own organization as an example to help you better understand this important role and uh, how it works in the United States. It's sort of Guanxi, how Guanxi works here in the United States to some extent. Um, and why don't we start uh, just with Lawrence and go, and you can stand up here or you can sit there, whichever you want. I prefer to stand. Fine. Uh, thanks very much, Jian. Dajiahao. <笑>我的中文名字叫麦勒人我知道我的中文讲的比你的英文差得多但是我舍不得放弃这个可以跟你们讲几句中文的机会谢谢 因为工作跟中国事务有关，能够有比较多讲中文的机会，我在你们这个年纪的时候，在亚洲住了十几年，包括北京、台湾和香港。不过回美国的这二十年来，因为缺少练习的机会，所以中文讲的比较不流畅了
Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, somewhat left-leaning tank, a very good one, yes. American Enterprise Institute, right-leaning tank, yes. Simpson. The Stimson Center, I think, isn't it? Yes. Any others? Yeah. World Resources Institute, big environmental tank with offices in Beijing, yes. Uh, Hudson Institute, more conservative. Okay, I think you, basically I don't need to give this talk. You all clearly know a great deal uh, about think tanks. Um, organizations that do policy research have um, existed for a long time, but the first freestanding think tank, as they're normally classified, was started early in the 20th century with money from Andrew Carnegie, the steel magnate, and it was the um, Carnegie Center for um, Peace. Um, subsequently, there were a number of others. Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in 1910. Um, and that began a tendency, which is that uh, people who have been extremely successful and made big fortunes as part of their philanthropic work will often endow a think tank or start one. And of course, the, the best known of these today is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which funds many think tanks in addition to their uh, more direct provision of services, um, and including my tank. We get some money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, there are another uh, funder that's very big in this space, some of you may have heard of, somewhat less famous, but very important in the think tank space, is the Hewlett Foundation, which is the uh, half of the Hewlett Packard computer and printer uh, fortune, the Hewlett family, uh, half of that. And Hewlett, like the uh, Gates Foundation and others, think that supporting policy research and the engagement in policy can be a very, very good way to leverage their money to achieve the changes that they would like to see. Uh, there are many other uh, smaller funders you probably haven't heard of. Um, the founder of my center is uh, Edward Scott, um, he made a fortune. He, the E is the uh, E and BEA Systems, one of the early foundational companies of the Internet. And he gave what, by Bill Gates' standards, is a very, very modest gift. He gave us $10 million to start and a promise of $10 million later. And that was enough to start my think tank about 11 years ago because my president, Nancy Birdsell, was able to then recruit world-class scholars and tell them that she'd be able to pay their salary for at least two or three years. And then we began to raise funds. And in, in the case of my think tank, we get money from foundations. We get money from uh, non-US governments. We call bilateral assistance, uh, mostly European governments. Uh, and we get some uh, individual contributions and some contributions from uh, private firms. Um, I just want to talk briefly about the evolution of think tanks. I think that this topic is mostly about foreign affairs. Um, there's a tradition in the United States that foreign affairs is sort of out of bounds for partisan politics. There, there had been, until about 10 years ago, very strong centrist view. And from a Republican to a Democratic administration, you didn't see very much change in foreign affairs. In the think tank world, that still tends to be somewhat true. Most of the highly partisan um, bickering about policy uh, happens on things other than foreign affairs. But it has indeed become much, much more um, contentious uh, and that really dates to a gentleman named Lewis Powell. He was a, a Virginia-based attorney, very tough attorney, who, among other things, had fought on behalf of the tobacco companies. And he subsequently went on to become a Supreme Court justice. But in uh, 1971, he wrote something that has become quite important in the history of think tanks called the Powell Memorandum. He was asked to write it by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And um, in it, he wrote, quote, that the... Uh, conservatives should retake command of public discourse by, quote, financing think tanks, reshaping mass media, and seeking influence in universities and the judiciary. And that's indeed what conservatives did. And so you had this maybe a little cozy centrist consensus on a lot of policy things, and the conservatives felt that their views were not included in that. And so uh, they went out and they hunted a variety, funded a variety of tanks that you've heard about, the Heritage Foundation, the Manhattan Institute, the Cato Institute, Citizens for a Sound Economy, Accuracy in Academe, and a whole variety of others, and really laid the foundations for what became the uh, Reagan Revolution and this resurgence of conservative thinking in the United States. As part of that, they took the centrist tanks, like Brookings and uh, CSIS, and they said, these are, cons these are liberal tanks. They branded them as liberal. Uh, they weren't really liberal. They're not even progressive, some of them. CSIS, I think, is actually probably now enthralled to the oil companies. 
Uh, but they branded them as liberal and thereby tried to polarize the discussion. In response to that, and seeing the success of the right-wing tanks, the progressive community started its own think tanks. And so we had the rise of organizations like the Center for American Progress that articulated the uh, values and the policy proposals of uh, people on the left. Both the tanks on the right and on the left do a number of things. They obviously do research. They, pu they put that research into policy proposals. They provide, if you will, ammunition for those who are, uh, don't have the luxury of doing research to further their arguments. Um, they also often serve as kind of a resting place for partisans who have been in politics. So if you are uh, you know, in the Senate or the House or more often a senior official in the administration and your party loses, what are you going to do for the next four years? So you find a job in a think tank. You can continue to write. You can comment. You can maybe write a book. You can be engaged politically. And then if the political fortunes change, you can go back into government. So that's, I think, an important function. And the tanks obviously love this because they get the benefit of somebody who's really been in the policy space. And then when they send them back in, that person carries the ideas that have been developed in that tank. So that's a, <coughs> a very important um, part of that. Um, maybe if I have just a couple more minutes, I'll give you some examples of my own think tank's work. Um, although, as you might have inferred from my remarks that I myself am a progressive, uh, my tank is nonpartisan. Uh, there are two vice presidents, myself and a colleague who's a Republican. Uh, and the overall, we don't take institutional positions, but the overall view of my think tank is that markets are great when they work. When there are market failures, then you should look to a policy solution that, in so as far as possible, will correct those failures and will mimic the market. So I think that's sort of a centrist view of things. Uh, people strongly on the left would think that we are uh, rather right-leaning. I think the perception of Center for Global Development in the UK and Europe, which tends to be somewhat further to the left than the United States, they see us as being neoliberal or conservative. Uh, here in the United States, where there's, I think, more of a conservative bent, some people may think that because we're involved in global development and care about, care about global poverty, that we may be more on the um, progressive side. Um, just a couple of examples of our work, and I choose these not because they're the most important, but because I have pieces of paper that relate to these that I can leave with you. Um, we are very concerned about uh, climate change and uh, the stalemate, especially in the United States, in taking action on climate because the impacts of runaway climate change, as you know very well, are going to be felt first and worst. In fact, are already being felt, especially by poor people in the developing world. And the uh, very high per capita emissions in the United States mean that the U.S. shares a very large share of the blame. Um, everybody in this room knows that China has now surpassed the United States as the largest single emitter, but you also know that China's per capita emissions remain far below those of the United States. And, of course, the historical emissions level, the burden that's in the atmosphere that's heating us all now, mostly came from today's rich countries because they've been emitting at high levels for a long time. So we're interested in mechanisms that can try to break the deadlock, especially here in the United States. And uh, as part of that, we produced a... Um, an online database called Carbon Monitoring for Action in which we were able to identify the location and the emissions of every power plant in the world and the companies that owned them. So um, if you're interested in climate issues, and I hope you are, um, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. One of the things that came out of that that I think uh, surprised people in India very much is that uh, the India State Power Company is one of the largest emitters in the world. And I think India had felt, well, this is a China-U.S. thing. We're not really responsible. But with our data, I think we helped to change the discussion in India where the people in India began to say, uh, we too are part of this problem and we need to do something about it. Um, another thing that we do is a commitment to development index. We rank the 22 members of the OEC Development Assistance Committee, the richest countries in the world, according to their policies in seven areas, including aid effectiveness, uh, investment, trade, environment, uh, and this is a way to understand how the rich countries um, uh, influence outcomes in the developing world. And finally, uh, I've co-written with my boss, Nancy Birdsell, a kind of an out-of-the-box proposal for a new global climate agency uh, that we are hoping and thinking that China might want to play a leadership role in creating that. And I actually have a Chinese translation of an op-ed that appeared in the Financial Times, um, which I'd be delighted if some of you would take that and read it. So I hope I haven't overstayed my time. 
Um, thank you all very much, and I look forward to discussing with you during the question period. I'm going to sit right here. Um, I'm Erin Ennis. I'm Vice President of the U.S. China Business Council. Um, I thought what I would do is um, give you a little bit of background on who the council is and what we do, um, and then tell you just a little bit about the way that we do advocacy, um, because I suspect it's probably a little bit different than what you might expect. The council was founded in 1973, so for those of you who know your history, that was right after the Nixon visits. And we were founded by U.S. companies that wanted to do business in China. So at that point, for a foreign company to do business in China, you had to have a license to be able to import a product into China. You couldn't sell it directly to a Chinese consumer. That had to go through a third party. Um, there were significant restrictions on where foreign companies could invest in China. So our uh, companies wanted to, despite all of those barriers, still wanted to access that market and figure out how to get in, but then also began um, advocating for improvements in how that market worked. Um, since China's join, uh, joining of the World Trade Organization in 2000, we've seen significant changes, obviously, in how foreign companies can operate in that market, although there's still barriers to, to what can happen. Um, given the nature of China's system, we do a lot of advocacy with both the Chinese and the U.S. government. Um, our advocacy with China's government tends to focus on either areas where things um, do not seem to be implemented according to how laws or regulations are laid out, where there may be discrimination between foreign and domestic companies despite the law suggesting that they need to be treated equally. But we also advocate on things that we feel are improvements that would benefit China's economy and it would help them advance their own agenda. So, for instance, many of our companies are um, companies that um, provide services in China, a sector where, you know, it's a, an area where there's a great deal of knowledge and expertise in the United States. About 80% of our economy is in the services sector here. But China still continues to restrict where foreign services companies can participate in that market. For China to effectively move away from its model of being export-driven, and uh, create the kinds of jobs that will um, be creating wealth for um, Chinese throughout the country and provide additional opportunities for the market to diversify, opening that market for services from foreign companies probably is going to be an essential element of it. So that's one of our topics that we work on. We also advocate with the U.S. government. Um, I think probably what most of you would think about in terms of advocacy in the United States probably has to do with lobbying Congress. And I am a registered lobbyist because that does affect what we do periodically. Um, I've been at the council for eight years and probably seven of the last eight years I've spent an extraordinary amount of time trying to stop currency legislation from being enacted. Um, from our members' point of view, um, not only is it not appropriate to focus in on a country's exchange rate policy as a trade measure, but realistically, the issues that were being raised on this topic by members of Congress were tied to things that really had very little to do with China's exchange rate. Um, in the debate here in the United States, it had to do with the idea that if China's currency got to closer equilibrium with the U.S. dollar, then we would see the U.S. trade deficit uh, reduce significantly or, in some of the talking points that I've seen, go away entirely, and that you'd see a massive inflow of jobs back to the United States. Well... China's currency has appreciated 30% in the past seven years. Um, I can say um, with certainty that the trade deficit with China is still very large, so apparently the exchange rate wasn't the driver in that. And if you read into the newspapers in the United States, we still struggle with employment issues. So while there might be some link um, in terms of the economics of how it all ultimately works, in terms of a driver of how the U.S. economy is going to change, um, currency wasn't the solution to our problems. Frankly, the solution to those problems probably are more domestic policies that we need to be looking at in terms of American competitiveness, looking at how our corporations are um, operating in this environment, what it would take to create new jobs here. Um, it's, it's a challenge in dealing with issues on China with Congress because um, as much as I think that our system uh, is um, the best one in the world, and I think um, we can prove that our economy is among the strongest and most innovative in the world. Um, we do have a tendency these days in Washington to look for the easiest solution to many of the problems that are out there. And particularly when it comes to new and rising powers that may, um, in many people's estimations, 
pose the United States as the world leader or in some way change what our perception is of where our economy is going, it's very easy to look for solutions that involve nothing that the United States might need to do and more things that, that foreign com countries might need to do. So that actually, this year, luckily, is less of what we spend our time on. Um, with China's rapid appreciation, well, with China's steady appreciation of its currency over the past seven years, the exchange rate issue, thankfully, has died down somewhat. Um, and Congress has shifted its attention, at least on trade issues, to things dealing with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, with the U.S.-EU trade agreement that they are working to negotiate, and with an agreement on services, which I had mentioned earlier. So our time with Congress is a lot less. What we spend more of our time doing these days, and which has been consistent throughout my time with the Council, is working to get the issues that are concerned for U.S. companies on the agenda for the U.S. executive branch. Um, as you probably know, there are at least, I think at one count we had heard, 200 different bilateral dialogues between the United States and China. That does not include any of the multilateral um, um, operations that are going on where the U.S. and China might meet um, in context of things like APAC or the G20 or those other organizations. Our task as an organization representing U.S. companies is to try to ensure that the U.S. government is aware of issues of concern. Um, that's not every issue for every company. Most U.S. companies do advocacy directly with not just the Chinese government but with other governments as well. And so their interest in using the U.S. government as um, an a venue to try to advance their issues usually comes only after they feel that they have exhausted all of their opportunities for them. But there are many opportunities given China's increasing openness about what its goals are and its efforts to transform its own economy for U.S. companies to be able to advocate how they can help provide um, services or expertise to advance China's goals. Things such as you know, transforming its economy into an innovative one strategic emerging industries, some of the key policies that China has. Foreign companies, and particularly our members, are very interested in participating in those programs, but that requires those programs to be non-discriminatory and allowing foreign companies to participate in an equal basis. So we do a lot of work on that front. We do still advocate on issues of concern. Many of our companies um, do have problems, um, but it is a, a matter of really finding that balance. Um, much like advocating with the United States government, or with Congress in particular, it's not as effective to make an argument to the U.S. government or to the Chinese government to say, let me tell you the 50 things you're doing wrong and why you're wrong in continuing to do them. We tend to try to ensure that what we are doing puts our points in the context of China's goals are to have an innovative economy. These are some of the policies that China has implemented that have held it back from truly expanding its innovation and creating the kind of innovation that will be sustainable and that will create competitive companies. This is, these are the policy changes that we think would be in, advisable for the Chinese government in the um, interest of Chinese companies in terms of it, uh, accessing the market and frankly would benefit foreign companies as well who are interested in participating in that market. Those are not just hollow points for our companies. The majority of our companies are in China's market to access Chinese customers and to employ Chinese um, citizens in their companies. So these are things that our companies have taken to heart and feel very strongly that being able to participate fully in that market is something that not only is in you know, the interest of the general goodwill of the world, but frankly is a key component of their bottom line for their corporations, and that's why it's so important to us. So I want to leave it at that. Thank you. Um, again, my name is, oh, you want to, applause, applause. <laughs> Again, my name is John Isaacs, and I'm with a group called Council for a Global World that was founded 50, 51 years ago to focus on nuclear weapons issues. And I was very dis bitterly disappointed when you were naming all sorts of think tanks, but you didn't come up with the name of our think tank. <laughs> because as with most organizations, a lot of organizations, we have both an ad advocacy organization, Council for a Global World, and a so-called think tank, Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. And quite frankly, the line between the two organizations and the line between ad advocacy groups and think tanks is not that uh, thick, shall we say, because everyone's trying to influence the policy one way or another. Now, let me start out by giving you uh, my view of what I call American Political Science 101, excuse me, American Foreign Policy Politics 101. There's a common perception in this country and abroad 
that Congress very often hamstrings the executive branch, forces it to do things it doesn't want to do, or stops it from doing things it wants to do. My argument instead, however, is that the executive branch largely gets its way on national security issues. I'm not talking about health care, immigration, guns, other issues in this country domestically, but foreign policy issues. And the executive branch has a clear advantage over Congress, over the advocacy groups, over the think tanks, over any other player or institution trying to influence policy. And that's the way it should be because you can't, especially with Congress, have 535 captains of the ship all trying to tell the country which way it should go. I give a rough estimate that 95% of the national security issues really are largely in the hands of the president and the executive branch, and Congress plays very little on, on those issues. And usually Congress is quite happy to let the president make the decision, especially a war peace decision, a lot of others, because Congress doesn't want to get either the blame or the, necessarily the credit on the decision. For example, there's a major dispute now what to do in Syria, and some people are advocating the United States should get militarily involved or more militarily involved. Uh, a lot of people advocating that, but Congress is not going to force the president to, to do that. It's his decision, his, his and his administration administration's decision. He will get a lot of advice from Congress, a lot of advice from groups about what he should do, but that's an administration decision. Or take Middle East peace. Uh, with, with Secretary of State John Kerry in office now, he's pushing hard again for a Middle East peace, as has been tried many times before between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Under the George W. Bush administration, the administration largely took a hands-off approach. Either way, it was up to the administration to decide what it wanted to do, and Congress could criticize, praise, carp from the side, but these are presidential decisions. And one more example, to get, bring it a little bit closer to home, the president could emphasize much closer economic and political relations with China, or it could instead emphasize the differences between the two countries on cybersecurity or on the disputed islands in Asia or human rights or dumping of solar panels. Or the president could do both. And again, Congress might have things to say about it, but it's up to the executive branch to make the decision what the US policy will be. Now, there are three exceptions to that rule in the national security field. Well, first, let me, I'm back up, I'm sorry. There are some issues, of course, I said, where the maybe 5% where the Congress does force things to happen. And most particularly, that's happening with American policy towards Iran right now, where Congress passes new sanctions almost by the week on Iran, trying to force that country to change its nuclear policy. And that is a, a situation, again, where the president has a policy, but he is, some, to some extent, hamstrung by Congress. Or the Congress can pass a lot of resolutions, which in the American political context mean very little, but to other countries tends to mean quite a lot. And one prime example of that is where Congress uh, periodically tries to denounce the, uh, the genocide uh, in, by, by the Turks against the Armenians oh, sometime around the end of World War I. It, the resolution never passes. It, never, it wouldn't force anything to happen. But nonetheless, just the consideration of that resolution upsets the Turks immensely. Now, again, there are exceptions to every rule. And there are three areas of foreign policy where I would argue Congress has a major role to play and where groups like ours, advocacy groups, or think tanks or others can make, it, make, have, have a, make a difference on what happens. First of all, the president needs appropriated funds to carry out his program. And when you're talking about foreign assistance, you're talking about um, virtually any program where the president needs money, the Millennium Challenge, he has to get that from Congress. And if Congress does not approve that fund, those funds, he has a hard time. He, he probably, it's going to be very hard for him to get around that. One specific example underway right now and for the last four years, the president has sworn he was going to close the Guantanamo Bay prison, but Congress has blocked him from that and blocked him from spending any money on that. So that's one area where Congress plays a role and we could play a role as well. The second area is treaties. Any major treaty needs a two-thirds majority to get approved by the United States Senate. And that means, for example, the treaty I worked on in 2010 
to cut nuclear weapons, a U.S.-Russian treaty, we needed to get 67 votes to get that through. And it was not an easy thing to do, but that's part of the Constitution, written, it, written 200 years ago, saying you need a two, the president needs a two-thirds majority to get that approved. A third area where the Congress can play an important role is through nominations. Uh, if you were here a few months ago when, when the president nominated uh, former Senator Chuck Hagel of Nebraska to be Secretary of Defense, Congress had an awful lot to say about that, had some very long hearings, launched some strong criticisms, used the hearings as a way to criticize not only Secretary Hagel, but also the uh, executive branch. Ultimately, however, Hagel was approved. But there are other nominations where the Congress may not stop the nomination, but use the nomination to raise questions or force the administration to make, take steps that they might not otherwise want to do. So on, especially on those sorts of issues where Congress has a role, it provides opportunities for lobbying groups or advocacy groups, either term is fine, to get involved in issues. For example, one of the things we're trying to do is get much deeper cuts in nuclear weapons. The treaty signed by U.S. and Russia in 2010 brought about some reductions, but we, need, we believe we need to go a lot further. And we hope that the president in his second term will go much further. But try to, conv to try to convince him to do that, we started working with senators on a letter to the president saying, you did a lot of good in the first term, but you think you can do a lot more in the second term. Here's some issues we hope you focus on. In the end, uh, largely with our doing, we managed to get 23 senators on that letter. This letter did not force the executive branch to do anything. The president is totally free to ignore the letter as he's free to ignore resolutions. But another, nonetheless, it can have an influence in executive branch policy, and we hope the president will be giving a major address on nuclear issues sometime in the next uh, month or two. Another area where we, where we care strongly and where Congress can have an impact is war and peace. Uh, I won't get into the constitutional issues because co Congress in many ways has abdicated its role in the making of war since, the, since uh, 1950 or so. But President Bush decided to go to war in Iraq. Uh, then there's also the continued fighting in Afghanistan that after 11 years is still going on. Our group, groups like ours on the left oppose, actually some groups on the right as well, oppose continued U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan. Uh, I know Congress won't actually cut off the funds for continuing the war. That's something Congress is very reluctant to do and it's not done since the Vietnam War in the 1970s. But there are ways, again, where we can work with Congress to try to influence the executive branch on its decision making. The President has declared all U.S. troops will be out of, well, most U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan by 2014 and the U.S. combat role will end in the next year or so. We're trying to find ways to encourage the administration to move that timetable up and ultimately work with a senator from Oregon on a first a couple letters and ultimately a vote in the Senate which passed 62 to 33, which urged the president to uh, accelerate withdrawal from, uh, from Afghanistan. Again, the vote doesn't require the president to do anything. The letters didn't force the executive branch to bend to its will, but it's a way to try to influence the executive branch. So going back to my very first point, as I conclude, I'll just say, largely foreign policy, national security policy, is an executive branch decision. Congress could play more of a role if it chooses, but it largely has declined to do so, and much less so than it used to many years ago. Uh, again, in the past, the Congress has declared war, including in the World War II against the Germans and the Italians, but, uh, uh, and the Japanese, but ever since that time, even in the Korean conflict and all the other conflicts in which the United States has been involved, Congress said, uh, we, don't wanna, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna get involved if we don't have to, we don't wanna start the war, we don't wanna stop the war, we wanna pressure the president, but it's up to him. And that largely is the way U.S. foreign policy is carried out. Thank you. These are three terrific panelists. Not only did they give you a lot of interesting content, but they all stuck to, not only stuck to the time limit, but several, two of them were under the time limit and one was right on. So we thank you for that because that leaves our audience here a lot of time to ask questions. I do want to give, if any of you want to make some comments on what the other has said, did that spark anything? 
Um, I would just have a question, actually, for all three of you. You've told us what your organizations do, but how do you go about it? How do you, what mechanisms do you use to try to influence others? And how might that, and Aaron, in your case, how might it different what, differ what the council does from what an individual business would do? The council is made up of about 220 U.S. companies. Um, our members in general are not only members of the U.S. Center Business Council, they're probably members of a sector-specific organization, like potentially the National Association of Manufacturers or the Information Technology Industry Association. They may also be members of organizations like the U.S. Chamber or other broader groups as well. Um, so in general, what we found that our companies do is they have specific areas of interest that they want to make sure that almost every organization they're a member of advocates on. So we coordinate with other like-minded associations on those kinds of things. Um, we also do some advocacy on behalf of some of our individual members, depending on what the issue is. But in general, the topics that we advocate on are ones that affect our broader membership, or at least a large chunk of our membership. So for instance, uh, foreign law firms are not able to um, operate in China as, as a fully functioning law firm. We've got probably about 20 law firm members, and so those are pretty regular points that we advocate on with the U.S. government to try to get on their agenda as well as with the Chinese government to try to have addressed. Um, we also, kind of the, the means that we use of that, um, a lot of meetings with the administration. Um, we do periodically send letters, uh, as was mentioned, um, sometimes on our own, sometimes with other associations. Um, I, I would say probably it's mostly just finding the talking points and the right way to address an issue and then raising it over and over and over again with every relevant official that it makes sense. So it's not just a matter of talking to the U.S. Department of Commerce about legal services issues, but also the U.S. Trade Representative's Office because they have regular meetings uh, with the U.S. Treasury Department, which is the lead on the commercial side of the strategic and economic dialogue. Um, with, you know, we, we identify as many people as we think might have influence on it and try to make sure that every one of them understands what the issue is, and if we're successful, they advocate on those issues then on the U.S. agenda. Um, actually, John, you have, in addition to your think tank side, I assume you also have people who are members that you go to if you want to influence. Can you talk a little bit about that and grassroots advocacy by your organization and maybe others who might do it? I'll take it a little bit more broadly. Uh, in, in a major campaign, again, stopping the war in Afghanistan, pushing for... Uh, additional nuclear reduction, there are a whole series of things that we undertake to try to convince the Congress or the executive branch to take the action. One, you've already heard about meetings with executive branch or meetings with members of Congress or their staff. It's important in anything we're working on to try to build a bipartisan uh, leadership group, not just Democrats, but Democrats and Republicans. And on at least on the issue of Afghanistan, we have managed to build a bipartisan coalition. Uh, in the Senate, it's important to build coalitions outside to get groups left and right working together as, as they are now in trying to cut the military budget. It's important, if, you, if we can, to get constituents, especially key constituents, major donors to senators or House members to contact their, their, uh, the members of Congress to try to persuade them to go one, one direction or another. Uh, we try to work with the media, trying to shape stories or try to get editorials from key newspapers giving the same position that we, 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 uh, we espouse. And we try to get experts to say the same things. In other words, when I advocate cutting the nuclear weapons, maybe people don't care. If you get a retired general, a retired Republican official saying the same thing, that could be more effective. All these parts, uh, all these are parts of a lobbying campaign. Grassroots work, uh, coalitions in Washington, getting experts involved, building member of Congress coalitions, all are part of a major campaign if you can manage it. Right. John, you want to add, Lawrence, to um, how your group works Yeah, on maybe to put my uh, remarks in context, I, I didn't say much about my center. We're about 60 people, about 20 senior researchers, 10 communications policy people, and then a junior staff. Um, we have a sort of an inside-outside strategy. That is, our work is based on very solid research. I think most think tanks would say that. It's truer of some uh, than for others, but uh, in our case, the research is extremely uh, rigorous, 
And then from that research, we engage both in publishing the papers, in blogging about it, in distributing an email newsletter, which I hope many of you will choose to sign up for, but also through the meetings. And I'll just tell you a short story that, that illustrates that. Um, one of my colleagues, Michael Clemens, leads our research on migration and global poverty. And uh, another colleague, Vijay Ramachandran, was looking at foreign assistance in Haiti after the earthquake. And they discovered two really interesting things. First, of the $4 billion in foreign assistance that was provided to Haiti after the earthquake, it's impossible to know what happened to the vast majority of it. There's basically no records. And the initial rush in after the emergency, maybe for three or four months, that's understandable. But subsequently, the reporting on how that aid has been deployed has been very, very poor. And also, there's very little to show for it on the ground. So despite a desire to help the Haitian people, there was very little to show for that money. The other thing that Michael found is that of the Haitians who have escaped poverty in the last generation, virtually all of them did it by leaving Haiti. Uh, and that's true around the world, that oftentimes we think of development as helping people to get less poor where they are. But very oftentimes, in the case of the Chinese immigrants to the United States, the immigrants who came from um, Ireland, uh, from Central Europe, a major way out of poverty has been to move. Uh, we also discovered through our research that there are about 50 countries, poor countries in the world, including most countries in Latin America, that are on a list that enables them to send seasonal workers to the United States to pick crops and do other jobs that Americans don't want to take. But Haiti was excluded from that list. And we figured if we could get Haiti on the list, that it would be possible for large numbers of Haitians to come here, do work that they're well qualified for, jobs that Americans don't want, to both improve their own lives and to send money home. And so we figured out, working with some uh, consultants on the outside, what it would take. It took a decision by the Homeland Security uh, Department and by the State Department to put Haiti on that list. And then we mounted a campaign that included mobilizing the um, members of Congress in both parties uh, who live in communities where there are large Haitian diasporas, large Haitian communities. And so uh, Marco Rubio in Florida has a lot of Haitian constituents. He was very interested in this. We got members of both parties to sign letters to the Secretary of State and to the Secretary of Homeland Security saying you should put Haiti on the list. Last year, Haiti was added to that list. So that's from research up through implementation. Then, unfortunately, I've learned recently that, and we worked on this with less success, the infrastructure to get the Haitians to apply for the visas to actually come here was lacking. In Jamaica, it's gone on for decades, and they send lots of people and they go home. In Haiti, it was hard to get that going, and of those who have come, a substantial number are overstaying their visas. So we're now working on trying to figure out ways that we can make sure that they do indeed go back so that others can benefit from the same opportunity. Okay, we're going to open it up for questions now. Let me ask, if you've asked a question already today, don't raise your hand. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you all for your uh, very informative talk. I really enjoyed it. So my name is Ying, and I'm from Columbia University. I recently graduated from, uh, uh, with a master's in international education development. And so this question is directed to uh, Mr. Lawrence McDonald. Uh, so uh, I was really intrigued by uh, the example you gave about Haiti. And then uh, I wonder, can you talk a bit more about the role of uh, think tanks in international development. How much influence do you think the work of think tanks have on the decision making in the international community? And if possible, can you give an uh, example perhaps from uh, uh, countries like China? Thanks. By international, I suspect you're thinking of things like the G20 of international policy arenas as opposed to just US policy. Does that sound right? Um, it's an area where we and other tanks are very interested. Um, there's an initiative underway currently. We're working with two other tanks, one in Korea and one in Canada, to develop some uh, policy initiatives that we hope to feed into the G20 in Australia. And as you may know, when uh, the Koreans hosted the G20 in Seoul, they pushed very hard to have a development agenda as a piece of the G20. And uh, think tanks and civil society groups watch those dialogues very carefully and try to get language inserted into those declarations that will further their goals. Uh, one that I would like to see very much in the future, we have some work on uh, forest conservation and preservation. It's going to be critical if we're going to avoid runaway climate change. 
Uh, there have been international efforts to do it. We believe that with some satellite verification systems, it'll be actually possible to pay for results. We would hope that the G20 might say something about that, although I suspect that they're not inclined to address that. Uh, we previously had big success with the G8, where we had an idea for vaccine finance that was an innovative pool finance uh, scheme. We call it uh, market, advanced market commitment. That is that a group of donors would pay in advance to buy a new vaccine when and if it exists. And we were able to mobilize six funders, some were countries. One was the Gate Foundation. The United States did not participate to pledge $1.5 billion, and that accelerated the development of a vaccine that prevents uh, pneumonia in children. And uh, as a result of that, a lot of kids around the world who would have uh, died from that disease have not died. So sometimes the international realm uh, can be very effective. A lot of times you wind up pushing to have a, a phrase in a declaration that maybe doesn't make much difference. I'm Matt from uh, California Institute of Technology, and this, te uh, this question is for Ms. Erin Ennis. So, um, I mean, in the past several years, I mean, we have uh, been watching like, how the Chinese government is directing the state companies. Um, and I think that's a very huge issue in China-U.S. relationships because the state companies that occupy uh, huge areas in very essential uh, industries, banking, uh, railway, uh, railway, and stuff like that. And recently, we see that our new uh, premier has stated that he would like to see a stepping back of the state companies. And... I would like you to uh, make, I'm, I'm just wondering like, what your comments on that and what kind of opportunities will exist will come out of this new direction for both U.S. companies and the Chinese companies that are interested in collaborating and bringing in more uh, private industry into those areas. Thank you. It's a very timely question. Um, let me give some context of my answer first. Um, we poll our members every year on um, what the business environment is like for them in China. And one of the questions that we regularly ask is who they're competing with in China. Um, about 90% of our companies tell us they're competing with other foreign companies in China. Um, maybe 85% say that they're competing with domestic private Chinese companies. And probably about 75 to 80% say they're competing with state and enterprises. So, you know, the, the important takeaway from that data from our point of view is the issues of competition within China's market in particular aren't unique to state-owned enterprises. Um, when you start diving down into what the challenges are for foreign companies about state-owned enterprises, but also about private companies in China, is really just a question of what kind of benefits are they getting and are those benefits available to foreign companies as well. Um, there are, it's, it's pretty clear what some of the benefits are for state-owned enterprises in that, you know, they have um, a very different operating structure. Um, they, um, while they are needing to pay more dividends to shareholders, you know, that's not a driving factor for them, which is very different from how um, foreign companies in general have to compete on those issues. Um, it is um, known that they probably get better treatment for things like bank loans. Um, you know, that one might not seem like a big deal, but if you're talking about building a multi-million dollar factory, and the capital expenses that you have versus a state and enterprise um, competitor are, you know, in the millions of dollars in terms of the payback. That can make a difference in terms of what your ultimate product price is, how you're going to compete in that market, whether you're able to capitalize and expand your production. So it's a, it's a multifaceted problem, but it's also a challenge in very similar ways for private Chinese companies. What we are looking at um, in terms of um, state-owned enterprise reform in China is twofold. The first one is, what are the natures of the reforms? Um, you rightly pointed out there's kind of what the, re the current government has pointed out is that there's really kind of different classes of state-owned enterprises. So there's the um, state-owned enterprises that are utilities, which um, are operating in a, in a sector where prices are still controlled in China, um, might be areas where the government wants to maintain some sort of an influence, versus state-owned enterprises that bottle milk. Um, probably not a product that you necessarily need the government's hand in and one that ideally in a functioning market you'd want them to be competing on the basis of what the market is doing rather than what government influence or assistance might be giving for them. So that's going to be an interesting distinction of which ones um, are designated as continuing to be protected and which ones are expected to compete more based on what the more based on what the market is doing, because I think we're probably still quite a ways before the market is really fully influencing how some of these companies operate. The other question is going to be, um, 
what some of these reforms actually do more specifically. Uh, one of the ones that we have heard uh, voiced most frequently is an interest in having more private investment in state-owned enterprises. Now, on the one hand, that could be a very important difference. And just in terms of corporate governance, um, more private investment, less government investment in a company could mean that they um, become more responsive to shareholders, that they are recognized that the market is more of a driver in what they're doing. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't address the underlying competition issues. If you're still getting benefits in the market, regardless of what your ownership structure is, um, that probably isn't making a significant change into what the rest of your competitors are able to do and how competitive you are as a company, independent of the assistance that you might get. The other distinction on that one in particular is of the announcements that we've seen on that so far, um, it has been very specific terms of what the, the allowable private investment would be. And the terms that are used is very specific to domestic private investment in, in state or enterprises, not foreign investment. So again, you know, kind of an issue of where the nuance goes in this. You know, ultimately, I think this is one where um, there is nothing that, that is bad that could come of having more competitive companies uh, and ones that are being driven more by the market. Um, how fast that goes, what it means in terms of employment in China, and so whether that influences how quickly they go, and what the companies look like on the other side is what we're going to be looking at. Okay. Thank you. My name is Eric, sorry. My name is Eric Zhang Zhang Shua, major in civil engineering from, from Florida Internet University. I have a question for Mr. Uh, Azax, yeah, if I'm wrong. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> All right, as you know, nuclear weapon was used as super weapon to balance between the, uh, the uh, Soviet Union during the Cold War between Soviet Union and, and United States. After, after, the, Cold, after the Cold War, uh, U.S. Became, became the only super nation in the, in the, in the world. Uh, so, but, but the threat of the, super, uh, of the, of the nuclear, nuclear weapon is still exists. Uh, for example, the, ta the nuclear test uh, of North uh, Korea and Iran, we, feel, we still feel the nuclear threat. Uh, but meanwhile, nuclear could be could be, could be good. Uh, uh, U.S. has the largest amount of nuclear uh, power plant in the in the world. Uh, so, what's your opinion of what's your what's your comments on the uh, change between the nuclear threat between two uh, two super nations and one super nation with uh, the the other small nations, and how how do you think? Um, to prevent the nuclear threat, uh, to the up, um, abuse of uh, nuclear uh, of nuclear weapon, but to develop a, to develop a nuclear uh, power plant in the world. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, one of my arguments is that during the Cold War, the United States, the so then the Soviet Union, just kept building and building more nuclear weapons. And at one point, there are 70,000 nuclear weapons on this planet, mostly in the hands of the United States and Soviet Union. Um, and those numbers have, and almost all those are bombs are, that are much larger than those that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. We've come to a point now where there are 17,300 nuclear weapons across the globe. Now, you can look at it in one fashion and say, well, we've cut, cut three... Th Three-fourths of the nuclear weapons across the globe, still most of those nuclear weapons in the hands of the United States and Russia, of course China, and there's some, uh, about nine nuclear powers all told. Our argument is that even while the numbers of nuclear weapons have declined, there is still a major threat to the world. There's a major threat that some accident could happen, some miscalculation, unlikely between the United States and Russia, more likely between India and Pakistan, which have a, share a long border, have fought three wars, have nuclear weapons, have very short warning time in terms of uh, launching a weapon. So we're, we're supporting the view expressed by uh, President Obama in 2009, moving towards a world free of nuclear weapons. That's not going to happen anytime soon, but there are a lot of steps we can take that should lessen the nuclear dangers. One of those steps, we believe, is reducing nuclear weapons, one is trying to keep nuclear weapons and materials out of the hands of terrorists who might use those, those weapons. Ultimately, the next stage we see is the U.S. and Russia negotiating another agreement to reduce nuclear weapons. But the round after that has to bring in China and has to bring in France, has to bring in, bring in Britain, North Korea, Israel, the other nuclear powers. Uh, 
there's also a movement, it's not just President Obama in this country, but some very distinguished former government officials, including Henry Kissinger, of course, uh, led the opening to China back in the uh, early 70s. He and some of his colleagues, pretty hawkish in many ways, have advocating going to zero nuclear weapons. But you were also asking about nuclear power and its relationship. Uh, our organization has been around for 50 years. We've managed to avoid that issue. For 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the agreement of the Non-Proliferation Treaty signed in, when, uh, in the 19... Uh, 60s and, and signed by maybe 183, 180 countries or so is that no country should develop, no new country should develop nuclear weapons, but any country that w should want to should be able to build a nu nu uh, nuclear power. There are disagreements within my community whether that's still a feasible bargain, whether if Iran goes ahead with its nuclear power plants with that, that it says it wants to do, how do you know when they're going to move from that step to building a nuclear bomb. And that's a serious problem that, that, to which there's no answer at this point. But again, we have focused on nuclear weapons. Nuclear power is a challenging issue that we uh, try not to speak about. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you for coming and sharing your work and knowledge with us. My name is Ching, and I'm a, uh, I just finished my first year in the public policy program at the University of Virginia. And International development has always been my interest, so this question is directed to Mr. McDonald. Um, I was just wondering, because when doing international development work in developing countries, there must you have to work with the local agencies and the government at the same time. And I'm sure a lot of countries, the governments are not so welcoming about like having outside organizations to inter here with their, you know, internal affairs. And when that happens, how do, you know, NGOs from the outside world deal with these kind of political freak frictions? And I heard, like, one possible solution is to um, create, in, like, demand in the, in that particular developing countries and having the, their people to advocate for this kind of rights. But what if the government are not an electoral government and they don't really, it's not their, they don't hold, like, they are not held accountable for this kind of responsibility. So, and what do organizations deal with this kind of situation? Oh, thank, thanks very much. Um, you're, you're at a great university. My daughter just graduated <laughs> from, from UVA. And I know that they have a good uh, development studies program there. Uh, your question touches on the role of outsiders in development, and I think that that's a central puzzle of the development uh, process. Um, just to clarify, my organization doesn't do that kind of work because we believe that we should start at home in improving the policies, and so if you look at the um, Commitment to Development Index, many of the most powerful things that the United States or other powerful countries could do are things they would do at home, like liberalizing their trade regime, making it easier for developing countries to export their clothing. We had this terrible factory collapse in Bangladesh that killed more than 1,000 people. Are there ways that we could influence the investment and purchasing practices of European and US firms to strengthen the incentives for better worker protection in Bangladesh? Those are the kinds of things that we're interested in. But addressing your question about the role of outsiders, uh, we study that to the extent that outsiders are already active in developing countries, very often well-intentioned efforts can go astray. And that's particularly true in foreign assistance. And so uh, my boss, Nancy Birdsell, friend of John's, I'm told, pass me a note, um, has together with her colleagues developed a new way of providing assistance. We're now piloting this in East Africa and several other places working with local groups and the UK aid agency, which is instead of providing money, say, for schools and saying we're going to work with the government and figure out what you need and we think it's probably better schoolhouses and more books and more teachers and roads and uh, latrines for girls, you just say, we've agreed with the government that for every additional child who completes primary school and takes a test beyond the projected rate of increase, we're going to pay an additional amount. Let's say it's $100. And then you stand back, because local people are going to know what's necessary. We call this cash on delivery aid. 
And so instead of being intrusive and monitoring, did the school building get built? Are the textbooks delivered? Are the teachers showing up? An outsider can't monitor all of that very well. You just monitor one thing. Are the kids, in fact, graduating, and are they taking a test? And then you hire an independent auditor to check on those statistics. And we hope by putting this focus on the outcome and not on the process, that will then incentivize changes in the society. And as a piece of this plan, we're using public information disclosure. That is, if a government enters into this plan, they not only have to present evidence that they've achieved the goal, they also have to make that evidence widely available to the public. There's some other group that we're, we're, we're not directly involved in in India in which they found that, it's not only true in India, but an Indian NGO did the research and found that very large numbers of kids graduating from primary school, given a simple reading test, you know, on a, on a card like this, sad stories, you know, a 10-year-old boy, he's been in school for five years, he doesn't know which way is up. He can't read a word. And so the, these groups, also there's a group called Tawesa in East Africa doing these assessments. They do these in the villages and they demonstrate the results, but also when they come to test, all the neighbors come around and they watch because these are often people who themselves can't read, but then they find out the result. And so we're hoping that by the provision of information about the results, it can then help to give the community the tools that it needs to insist on better outcomes. Um, hello, um, my name is Wu Zihui. I'm from Columbia. I'm a law student. Um, sorry. So my question uh, for Mr. McDonald is, um, you, I noticed you label the think tanks at right or left or progressive. And I just wonder, um, do these think tanks identify themselves as such, or are these labelings um, more the perception of the think tanks, and are these labels, um, or are these positions kind of change over time? Because my impression of think tanks is they tend to, or they try to be, uh, appear to be independent and, and neutral, but, um, I, so I want to um, see what's your view on that. And my second question is, do... One uh, question. Sorry. It's related. <laughs> like, do government come to think tanks to uh, ask for uh, research reports as well? Thank you. Yeah. Um, the business of labeling is very interesting. In be before this Powell Memorandum that I described, most tanks would have told you that they are non-ideological and they are centrist. Brookings, for example, you know, has been in existence for a long time. That's what they would say, that they're nonpartisan. With the rise of the tanks on the right, they were very explicitly ideological. They said in their statement of purpose, we are there to make the case for conservative values. And they pointed at the centrist tanks and they said, you guys are liberals. And those tanks did not want to be called liberals. They didn't think of themselves as liberal. So now there's some confusion around Brookings. Is it centrist or is it liberal? Well, it kind of depends who you ask. In response to the rise of the explicitly conservative think tanks, you then had a reaction on the left, and so the Center for American Progress has in its name progress that goes with progressive, and they will say, we are about progressive values. There are other tanks, like the Urban Institute, have a strong interest in poverty. They have a historically, you might say, left-leaning view, but they would say, you know, we work with all parties. We're non-ideological. We're just very interested in the welfare of poor people. Uh, so then their studies tend to track what happens with welfare reform. Does it work or does it not? They would say that they're nonpartisan. The right-wing tanks would say that they're leftist. So that the labeling is complex. Um, governments do come to tanks for ideas. I think they come to the centrist tanks. One of the reasons that we like to be nonpartisan is that we want to be able to appeal on both sides of the aisle. Um, and there's a whole realm of tanks that we have not talked about that are, in fact, government-supported. The National Academy of Sciences... There's probably 30 or 40 of them. I was looking at Wikipedia last night. The government itself has tanks, and these are much more like many of the tanks in China. Also in China, we see the beginning of the emergence of more independent tanks. So there's a spectrum of think tanks. The U.S. has lots of government-run tanks. The ones we've been talking about today are independent. China tends to have government tanks and is now getting more independent ones. So I think that we're seeing a bit of a, a tendency for the think tank world to become more complex and more similar across countries. Uh, just to elaborate on that more, when the government comes to you, in China, there are certain government entities that have their own think tanks or that, uh, you know, kicker, which would, you know, uh, the foreign policy would go to a certain think tank and say, here, you do this research for us. Does the government, is it a bidding process, 
or does the government go specifically to a think tank and because then they could be going to the think tank that they know is going to mirror their ideas. So how do they get something that's going to be valuable for them and not just a mirror image of what, they're, what they think? Yeah, both things happen. So government agencies commission research. In my tank, we do not take any U.S. government money because we're in Washington. We do take non-U.S. government money because we're less worried about being unduly influenced. But USAID, the aid agency, they give out contracts for research. Some U.S. tanks accept them. I learned just yesterday that the Overseas Development Institute, which is the sort of grandmother development think tank in the U.K., has a contract from USAID to do a body of research. So um, organizations contract for research both within country from their own tanks and outside. Uh, also, tanks that have ideas look for openings, and that's what we tend to do. And so there's somebody who works for me, was formerly a registered lobbyist. She knows how the Hill works. She talks to a lot of people. And then recently we got interest. I talked in response to one question about this cash on delivery aid. There's a Republican senator or, or congressman who's really on fire about this and wants to introduce legislation to set aside funds for USAID to do a pilot on this. So think tanks responds. will apply to the government to say, we want to do research for you on X role. Well, this is more about going to government decision makers and saying, we have an idea and we think that you'll like it. Um, there are funding windows. We don't seek that fund, but there are funding windows, and some tanks will apply to U.S. money. Although I think those that are most actively involved in trying to influence U.S. policy often try and avoid that because of conflict of interest. If you testify before Congress, my, my colleague Todd Moss testified last week. If you look at our homepage, you can see him uh, testifying there. Uh, whenever we testify, you have to say, do you receive U.S. government money? And we always want to be able to check the box that says, no, we do not. And so we don't take U.S. government money. Lawrence, thank you so much. For I hope you'll find it useful. John, thank you very much. Okay, more questions for our right here. Champagne, right there. General, gentleman in, in the pink shirt, the white, white shirt. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Gu Yang, and I'm from New York University School of Law. And I'm a recent graduate. Actually, that is where the Chen Guangcheng was during the past year. <laughs> and uh, my question is to Aaron Ennis. And you just mentioned the law, a legal market in China is not fully open to uh, international law firms. Since I, you know, uh, I work in one of them, and we'll probably uh, continue practicing there later. So, could, could you please elaborate a little bit on this? Uh, what are the response and uh, reaction from Chinese government? And what are your prediction and uh, expectation in the near future? Thank you. Sure. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with what the restrictions are on law firms in China, why don't I start there? So there are um, three major issues that we've identified and that our law firms feel are the most important for them to be addressed. So the first one is that um, a Chinese lawyer who has a, you know, their law license in China has to give it up if they go to work for a foreign law firm. So only a Chinese law firm is able to employ Chinese lawyers or you know, foreign lawyers, for that matter, who have a law certificate in China. The second form of discrimination is that foreign law firms are taxed at a higher rate than domestic law firms are. So um, while it doesn't affect, affect um, necessarily the kind of legal advice you might get, it certainly affects what your bottom line is. And law firms, like any other company, um, have to make a profit. That's the point of having it. Otherwise, you can't pay your bills. The third biggest uh, issue for our companies is that in addition to not being able to um, have Chinese lawyers who have retained their law licenses working for foreign firms, foreign firms are not also not allowed to represent their clients before a Chinese government agency. So let me just give you an example of that one. Let's say that you make water bottles and you've been accused of selling your product in China at an unfair price. You've been accused of dumping. That goes through the Ministry of Commerce. The Ministry of Commerce has an office that just deals with those issues. At this point, and how China's laws are written and implemented, because there's some question about how much is specific and how much is just interpretation of what's allowed and what's not allowed. But at this point, if I, as a U.S. company making water bottles accused of dumping in China's market, I would have to hire a Chinese law firm to accompany me to any meetings with the Chinese government to talk about my case, for any of the filings that I was doing, because my domestic law firm, a U.S. law firm, would not be allowed to represent me, even if they weren't saying anything in the meeting. They couldn't even accompany me to the meeting. 
So it creates a lot of complexity, not just for law firms, but also for clients in deciding what they're going to do. From our point of view, um, there are good sound reasons why it's in China's interest to open up the market to foreign law firms. I mean, as, as Chinese firms begin to not only um, become more competitive to the SOE question that we had earlier, but also to invest overseas, you know, ideally what you want to have is one-stop shopping in your law firm. You want to be able to have a law firm that's going to be able to help you in the United States, in India, in China, elsewhere. And the kind of restrictions that are put into place mean that China is creating a dual system for, for not only foreign companies operating in China, but also for um, domestic companies that are there. They have to get separate counsel to do anything they're going to do um, outside of China. It also means that you have less expertise and what you're doing. I mean, again, some Chinese law firms have gone overseas, but not many at this point. But, I mean, again, if you want the best legal counsel for what your international operations are, in general right now you probably need to go to an international law firm. Um, and that, that means that Chinese law firms aren't benefiting from the experience of learning all of these things from, you know, what their foreign competitors can do. Um, it's certainly a challenge. It might mean that not all law, Ch domestic Chinese law firms get the same number of clients that they might. But, you know, that's the element of competition that makes a market stronger, not weaker, is having competition and companies who are actually able to survive on that, survive through that. Um, certainly the taxation issue, in our view, is just simply one of discrimination. There's no reason that the firms that are doing the exact same thing should be taxed at different rates. Um, in terms of your last question, in terms of the prospects for dealing with this, um, I'm ever hopeful. Um, I'm, I feel that my arguments are extremely compelling. And um, I'm sure that they will persuade someone if I say them enough. Um, but we are actively having discussions, not just with the U.S. government, with the Chinese government on these topics. Because it is an issue that, you know, China never has to open its, its legal services market if it doesn't want to. Um, it's a topic that there were only limited commitments that it made in its WTO accession agreement. So it could choose to never open its market to foreign law firms. But in our view, that's not in the interest of the market for its own development. And it would probably be better suited by having it open. So our hope is that there, we will see some progress, even if it's just starting with something like allowing a foreign company to actually accompany a client to a meeting with the government. That's at least a start. And from that, then you can build on it. OK, um, right back. Um, my name is Ki Fu. I uh, came from Stanford University. I'm in the Graduate School of Business, uh, graduating in about two weeks. Um, so my question is regarding uh, yesterday news. Uh, there will be a Chinese meat processing company acquiring one of the largest. I mean, uh, it's the largest uh, meat processing company in the U.S. So I'm not sure whether it will cause some concerns in the U.S. that uh, in the future it will be a threatening in terms of the, like a food safety, you know. So obviously you need to go through some sort of a, a approval process in terms of a committee uh, of foreign investment. So, uh, so in light of uh, more and more capitals flowing out of China and uh, want to do investment in the U.S., can you share the experience or some advice in terms of uh, lobbying in the Washington? How is the process and what's your advice to the Chinese companies uh, which may want to do investment in the U.S. and may need to obtain government approval in the future? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I don't think there's much of a national security concern over ham. <laughs> I fully agree. And actually, that's the one point that I was going to start with. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, again, so for those of you who haven't been following this, yesterday um, Smithfield Foods announced it's being acquired by a Chinese um, agriculture company. Um, and as I had mentioned in my opening comments about Washington being quick to come up with almost anything to complain about China on, um, by yesterday afternoon almost every one of the news organizations had found someone to go on air and talk about how this was a national security issue for the United States. We needed to be <laughs> concerned about food safety because a Chinese company was buying a U.S. pork company. Um, I, I think it's, it's a hard case to make. This is a national security issue. Um, the reality of the transaction itself is it is a Chinese company acquiring a U.S. company because the company has very high quality food safety standards. They export to China. The interest of the Chinese company is to export more U.S. pork products from the United States to China because it has higher food safety. At least at this point, there is no discussion of um, uh, pork being produced in China and brought back to the United States. But even if that happened, USDA has very specific rules on what has to be done for meat products to be imported into the United States. And so 
Um, I don't think that there is um, even a um, broader sense of what the, whether health and food safety is a national security risk. I don't think that's at play here. Um, just as an interesting slide, you know, the, they, did, they are going for CFIUS approval, so the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, CFIUS only reviews transactions or only makes determinations on whether there's a national security um, implication. So my assumption is that they've decided to do this really as a matter of showing that there is no national security concern, that the Treasury Department will come back and say, no issue here, proceed with your transaction. Um, the U.S. bases those decisions based purely on a national security deci um, decision. So, you know, is it U.S. infrastructure, um, telecommunications are some very specific areas they look at. By contrast, interestingly, China, when it approves its own mergers and acquisitions, has an added step of national economic security. Um, so if a similar transaction was happening in China, it might be judged based on what it would mean, particularly given China's um, personal, given China's interest in food security kind of beyond the food safety issues. So I think it'll get a little different here and here. Um, the last part of your question had to do with kind of the experience of the foreign companies here. Yeah. Um, there is a lot more Chinese investment going on here now than there had been in the past. I think we are still very early on. If you look at the, just the dollar value and the numbers of transactions, it is a fraction of what European companies, Japanese companies, um, Latin American companies invest here. So I think there's a great deal of expansion on the horizon of it. Um, I think one, I think probably two of the biggest barriers to it at this point, one is perception. Um, again, there's a very different approval process in China for these kinds of transactions than it is in the United States. And I think that, that investors aren't always fully aware of what the differences are between how you invest in China and how you invest here. But that leads to my second point. I think that getting better educated in the market and hiring good legal counsel, but you know, also you know, when it comes right down to it, I'm sure that um, if you dig a little uh, into this transaction with Smithfield, what you'll see is they not only have legal counsel, they most likely have um, retained a public relations firm of some sort. There probably is um, a financing firm that is helping them think through what the financing structure is of the deal, how they came up with, you know, what the dollar value was for the buyout of the shareholders, all of those kinds of things. You know, there are, for better or worse, the U.S., in the United States, you can hire consultants for everything, but it's worth the money um, because it, it, this is a fairly open in investment environment for all companies from almost any country in the world, but it's also very complex. And having good counsel on those kinds of things can make the difference. And so that's why I think that companies like Wanchang, which has you know, bought A123 and has a variety of other auto parts manufacturers, you know, other companies have done it, who have done it successfully have um, accepted the fact that they can't do it on their own and that the U.S. system is different than China's, and so they need to get good counsel based on what the U.S. system is. For observant Jews and Muslims <laughs> who don't eat pork, they're happy to outsource pig products to China. Thank <laughs> you for the opportunity. So I have a question for Mr. Isaac. Uh, I'm a, uh, my name is Clara, and my Chinese name is Zhu. Uh, I'm a human resources and management student, graduate student in Rutgers University. So my question has something to do with that. So with the meeting of between the President Obama and the Premier, uh, sorry, the Chairman, Chairman Xi, around the corner. So what do you think is the most profound influence the, of, the, of the policy concluded by these two leaders that has upon the communication and exchange of uh, young people of these two countries? And what is the big challenge to attract and retain talents for America too, from countries like China? Thank you. Obviously, there's been a lot of controver controversy between the United States and China over a number of issues. Nonetheless, the in, in economic interdependence between the two countries, I think, is critically important. Uh, there, when, when the Soviet Union disappeared, people and some conservatives in this country thought, oh, boy, the next big confrontation is going to be with China and envisioned a military conflict with China. I think all the trade, all the, the trade economic uh, relations between the two countries helps guarantee that that kind of confrontation will never will never happen. And so I think the most important thing is to solidify the economic ties between the two countries. In terms of education exchanges, I know very little. I did read an, uh, an article in the last few days that there are 190,000 Chinese students studying in the United States at this point. And I've 
general believer that the more people who study in other countries, Americans in other countries, people from other countries in this country, it's, it's extremely important to understand what other people believe besides your own kind, shall we say. I studied in Italy as part of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. I studied in France for a semester. I mean, these kind of exchange programs are very important. Uh, the Chinese and Americans will always have disagreements, as we do with any country, or as any family will have, but it's important to understand the other countries, understand the point of views, understand their arguments, and try to find common ground as much as possible. Does that respond to the question? To, to attract what, I'm sorry? You probably can answer that better than I. Yeah, um, I, I would bet that probably everyone in this room probably could identify what, what our companies tell us the biggest challenge is, and that's the U.S. visa process. I mean, if you're talking about bringing people here and being able to retain them, the, the process is very difficult. Um, in terms of um, identifying and retaining um, qualified employees in China, um, you know, the market is such right now in China that it's, it's, a, it's a seller's market. So workers really can pick and choose. Um, turnover rates are very high. So retention is probably the bigger challenge than recruitment for companies. Um, and the challenge is they're, they're, that wages are getting to the point in China where you can't increase them 20% every year. Um, at a certain point, you price yourself out of being able to do that. So companies are having to think more creatively about what benefits packages they give, what kind of training opportunities they give, those kinds of things. Okay, and the last question was uh, you. My name is Yan Qin Liu from University of Utah. I'm studying communication. So my question is, um, from my observation, it seems the United States doesn't promote gun rights in the foreign policy, especially in terms of U.S.-China relationship. Does it mean gun rights is problematic in the U.S., or do you think? Thank you. Ooh, this one's definitely yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could... Gun, you mean gun control laws, right? In this country, as you probably have watched the disputes in the United States Senate ever since the killing of a, 26 children in, in Connecticut, uh, the issue of guns have, has risen in, in prominence in this country. But we've had these kinds of slaughters or assassinations or use of guns to kill an awful lot of people throughout American history. But the people, such as the National Rifle Association and associated groups, strongly believe that every American should be able to have a gun, assuming they're not uh, mentally deranged or criminal. And so any effort to try to restrict guns in this country, even if they're successful uh, briefly for a few years, and that happened after President John F. Kennedy's assassination in the 1960s, ultimately gets overturned. There are an awful lot, it's not just the groups like National Rifle Association. Guns are an important part of American legacy. It's not right in my, my view, but even in states like New England, Vermont, and New Hampshire, which are generally liberal on a lot of issues, believe in the right to hold guns. And so that uh, same view no restrictions on guns seems to be uh, spread overseas. There was a recently signed arms trade, small arms trade treaty. I think it was signed in New York about a month and a half ago, and the United States was part of those negotiations. But groups like National Rifle Association, which does not want to see any restriction on almost any restrictions on guns in this country, also doesn't want to have any restrictions on selling guns abroad, and that's a, a problem. But our U.S. Supreme Court basically said the Constitution, writ written more than 200 years ago, guarantees the right of every, almost every American to have guns, and there's little that Congress, Congress can do some things, but the political power of the proponents of guns is too, is too strong to overcome. Okay. Thank you very much to our three speakers, minus one. Um, we're very pleased they could be here and give us such interesting and, and positive um, information. <laughs>